Hello and welcome to Climbing the Interface Ladder lecture number two, Basic Interfaces. So the last time we set up a simple inventory with a very very simple interface and managed to connect them together and allowed you to actually use this inventory with the interface for something. But you know, the interface itself was very simple. We just drew one simple rectangle, that was the only thing we did. So, um, right, should we make it more advanced? Yeah, I think so. We should add some more basic features. So, nothing too fancy, but if you just do it properly, it will still be quite fancy and quite useful. But we'll still uh, stay at a basic level today. So, let's get started. So, this is the GUI machine from last time. So, like I said, uh, the only thing we do is actually draw one simple rectangle. We define that we draw from 0, 0 to X size to Y size, and we do that at the position GUI left, GUI top. So, what I'm going to do today is a bunch of things. But to start with, I'm going to add some text. How do we add text? It's fairly simple. What we want to do is to dr draw that in the foreground level, uh, um, not level, but f foreground uh, layer. Uh, draw um, for is it called foreground? No, draw GUI. Sorry, there you go. Draw GUI container foreground layer, and we get X and Y here. And we don't need to do that super cool there that it added for us. And basically, what this allows us is to draw text. So we draw text in, in the very front, whereas we draw the, the textures here in the back. And we have a difference here, apart from just well, that the foreground is obviously on the on, in front of the background. And the difference is, well, here we have to use UI left and UI top because co the coordinate zero zero in in the background grid is in the very top left of the screen. However, in the draw UI container foreground layer the zero, 0 coordinate is in the very top left of the interface rather than in the very top left of the screen. This basically means that when we draw a string we don't have to refer to GUI left and GUI top, we just refer to how far from the very top left it is. Um, I don't really know why it's set up like that, it's just how it's being rendered in the GUI screen class. But uh, never mind that. What we want to re refer to is the font renderer, and th that's a part of the GUI itself. So that's why we don't have to like get it from somewhere else. We just we can just do font renderer, um, and then when we have that, we we can do quite a few different things. But the usual things is uh, can be found here. Draw sp uh, not draw split string. We'll take a look on that later on. But what I want to do is just draw a normal string. And what we have is four different parameters uh, where we have one string, and that's that one is simple. That's just for what we want to type. So, silly machine, there you go. Then we have the x coordinate, and like I said, we don't have to do anything with UI left. So, by typing 8 here, that means we have 8 pixels from the very left of the interface where the interface starts. And then I can add a 6 here. Uh, for, for the y value. The last one is the color, and believe it or not, that's actually an integer. And how we define it is something like this. There you go, that's a gray color. So by adding a 0x here in the beginning, we're adding uh, the rest as a hexadecimal value, and by adding 40, 40, 40 here, it should be 40, 40, 40. Um, oops. Um, it's going to be a gray color. We'll touch a bit more on that in, in course 6 when you talk about binary and stuff. But um, if, you, if you don't understand how to define a color, just make a quick Google search about hexadecimal colors because that's basically what this is. Um, so we just define it like that. So it basically means that we have that's the red part, that's the green part, and that's the blue part. And then we, uh, well, basically put that together to a color like that. So a gray color there. Okay, so that's basically it. That's how we draw strings. Done. We'll, like I said, we will take a further look later on, like draw split strings, and we'll take a closer look on the color as well later on. But uh, that's how we draw strings. Now we have a silly machine title there. What I'm going to do next, before we actually test this out, is to um, create a button as well. Uh, it's nice to be able to click something to, to do something. Uh, and what I'm going to do is we head over to the blocks here, so block machine. You might remember from the last time that to to open the interface, I had to remove the functionality that we did before when we right-click, and this is the disabling code, the code we use to disable and enable the uh, the machine itself. So now we can't disable it anymore. So it would be very nice to have a button in the interface that does that for us instead. So let's get going. How do we add a button? Well, we need to do that in 
init GUI here. And what we can do here is just specify the buttons we want. But just to make sure, uh, we need to clear the list of buttons. Uh, so if it tries to initialize this again, we're not going to get the old buttons or anything. So just clear the list of buttons. Button list dot add, and now it's just a matter of adding a new GUI button. So that's what it's called. Um, and what we want to do here is specify quite a few things. And the reason is, of course, because there's quite a lot of things to specify. The first one is the um, ID. We want an ID for this button. And then we want four parameters telling us the size and the location of it. And finally, we want the text. Um, so the location here, is the X location, I want to refer to where the interface starts. And then 100 pixels to the right of that start. Then I want a similar thing with the top, so I refer to GUI top plus 14, so that's 14 pixels from the top. Um, and what I want to do then is just define the size. I'm going to go with 60 times 20, so 60 in width and um, 20 in height. And finally I need to give it a text, disable. And by adding it to the button list here, I'm actually making sure that it's being rendered. Uh, maybe we should import that, so Control shift o for that. And there we go, that's a button. You don't have, need to specify anything more to make it render and uh, be fancy there. But of course, it doesn't do anything. We need to add some functionality to it. And what we will have to do here is override another method called action performed. Uh, we don't need, oops, silly me. We don't need the super call there because it's empty uh, by default. And you, when I remove the super call, so I've actually made sure that it's, it doesn't do anything. Here we will have to have the super call because otherwise, well, you can try it yourself, but the interface is going to look very weird. Um, but in this case, it doesn't do anything in the in the super class at all, so we can just uh, override it completely. Um, so when we have the button here, that's the button that is being pressed. So as soon as the button is being pressed, it's going to be uh, sent to us here. So what we can do is just check that. All right, if that's the the button where we want, uh, then we can uh, print uh, clicked. So obviously this is not what we're going to do in the end. Yes, print clicked. But um, it's a good start. So let's start in Minecraft and take a look on the the font here that we all the uh, text that we draw and also how the button looks, how, how what we're doing, um, well what that does in the game. So I'm just going to start the client here. Right. I'm going to join this wall here. Oh, it's just the flat world of a simple machine here. Um, so as you can see, we have the silly machine here. Yes, because, well, I said draw silly machine. Um, I can move it out here. Draw silly machine at 86. Uh, that's the corner there, uh, the top left of it. And then with the, with the gray color. And actually, the color 404040 40, 40 is the one that vanilla uh, interface is actually used. So if you want the same color, you can use the uh, OX 404040. Um, or you can use any other color if you want to. We're going to use another color later on as well. And then we have the button here, and if I click it, you can't see it, so I will have to go into another view. But if I click it, it's uh, going to say click there in the bottom. Okay, so, so it detects that I click it, but well, it's far from now. So let's close that and zoom in again. So we have a problem. What's our problem? Well, if we want to change something, if it's disabled or not, we have to change its metadata, right? And uh, that's what we had from the last course. So if you didn't take that course, basically, if we want to disable it, we want to change its metadata. Now you know that. But we can't do that from here. Why? Well, the interface is, does only exist on the uh, client side. And, um, well, we need to change the metadata from the server side. So that's our problem. So how do we want to do this? Well, we need, of course, to send the information to the server that the user clicked the button. And to do so, I'm going to head over to the packet handler that we've had before and used for the spaceship triggering when the player wanted to drop um, a, a bump. But like I said last time, that was the last course as well. So. Um, 
if you didn't take that course yet again, uh, we can just follow along anyways. But uh, I want to send a ship packet here to, to tell uh, the player to do something specific. Uh, well, the ship to drop the bomb basically. But now, now I'm already using this pack handler to its maximum. So what I will have to do, which is a proper thing to do, uh, is to like write, um, let's see, write byte, and for instance, write it like so. So now I'm telling it this when I drop a ship packet, that's sort of type zero, and when I drop something else, then that's another type. And I am actually just going to copy the whole thing here because it's going to work pretty much the same. Set button packet. But what do I want to send here? Well, I want to send the um, um, ID so I can have multiple uh, buttons. And here I want to just send a one. And the reason why I want to send a one there is so we can distinguish it from the uh, ship packets. So we can just read the first byte we get and check if, well, if it's a ship packet for dropping bombs or a button packet because someone just clicked a button. Um, so yeah. But then we need to write a byte here as well. Um, uh, the ID, sorry. Okay, so I failed to send button button uh, click packet. There you go. Uh, so we're just going to send it using the channel that we have there and we will receive it up here. But how will we know which block that clicked it? Uh, well, wh which block that owns this interface? We obviously need to change that block and not a every uh, machine block that we do have. So it would make sense to maybe get the tile entity here when we tile entity machine uh, like this. And then do something like this, data stream dot write int uh, machine dot xcode. We haven't imported the tile into the machine, that's why it's uh, telling us that it's wrong. And yes, go go like this. That would make sense, right? But because then I then I can use it later on. Uh, I need to re spell machine properly, so I can refer to that, read it, and yes, get the tile entity there. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, but it's completely useless because we don't need that. We can do it without actually having to send any information about the location. I'll sh I'll show you. But th this would totally be possible. There's nothing wrong with it, really. But if we can avoid it, then there's no reason why we would have to send that information as well. So when we uh, head over to here on packet data where we receive it, what we obviously will have to do is read which type of packet we have. So for the uh, ship, we have we send a zero to start with. For the button, well, another type of packet, then we will obviously send a two and a three and a four and so on. Uh, so the first byte is telling us which type of packet we do have. Some sort of header there. Um, so the first thing to do is byte um, packet ID equals reader dot read byte. Okay. And then it's just a matter of making a switch here. So packet ID um, case zero, and then we can just add this old code from the last course when we dropped bombs uh, in here. And then it's just a matter of adding another case. There you go. So now we can handle our buttons here. So how do we do that? How do you do that without knowing where we are? You know, we don't send along. Uh, well, where this should happen, we only send along that it is a button packet and which button we have. That's not enough, is it? Well, I just said it was enough, so hopefully it is. Um, what we can do after, of course, we get the um, button ID, that's the next byte we write, right? So we have uh, the one there, and then we have the ID. So it's just a matter of doing button ID equals reader dot read. But, and as you can see now, I'm actually reading different things depending on the first value, and that's totally fine, because that's basically what it is. If we write a zero, then the, we want to write an int, so therefore we can read an int afterwards. If we write a byte to start with, with, with the value one, then we want to read another byte afterwards from here. So that's that one. So we get the button ID, like so. And when we have that one, what we want to do is the following. This thing. Here you go. So what is this? Uh, import the inventory dot container one there. You go. So when you open an interface, 
we've seen that when we open an interface, we do that on the server side. That we check that the world well is not remote. That's the server side. We open it on the server side. What happens when we do so? Let's check uh, check the GUI handler. Well, on the server side, we create a new container. On the client side, we create a new GUI, which creates a new container. We have the container on both sides. What this is meaning is that the, the server side will still know that the player has this container opened because it happened on the server side. So therefore, we can just ask the player, which is your open container? Like, which interface do you have open? We, do, we won't get the interface itself. We will get the underlying container because we do automatically get which player that sent the packet. So we can do specific things for that player. So there you go. We can just ask it, which is your current opened interface? And just to make sure that we had something there, we can do uh, if container is not equal to null and container instance of container machine. Like that. Uh, machine. So in it's it would be totally possible to send which um, oops which coordinates the tile entity had, but there's no reason to if we if we want to do something in the interface because then we can just ask on the even on the server side which is the player's current open container because when the player has an, an interface open on the client side it will still have the container open on the server side so if we have the container is that really what we want no we want a tile entity so how would we sort this out well it's fairly simple if we take a look on the container this is the container machine that we made last time well, can you see something? I can see something. I can see that we have the machine here, and we save the machine to here, like so. So we we're going to store it anyway. So we can just add a method here: public tile entity machine get machine return machine. There you go. So uh, head over to packet handle again, and now it's just a matter of doing this: tile entity machine. Um, container get machine. There you go. So instead of having to send two bytes and three integers for the position, we only send those two bytes. So we send two bytes instead of four, which is quite a good deal actually. Because, well, why send 14 when we can then send only two? And then we just use the information that we already have to get the tile entity anyways. So we haven't got the coordinates uh, sent along, but we can still get the tile entity. And if we want to know where the coordinates, we can just refer to the tile entity and ask it, where are you? You know, X code, Y code, Z code, very simple. But we don't want that. What we want to do is tell the machine, someone just click the button in your interface. So maybe you want to do something. Receive uh, button event and then um, button ID. There you go. Create that method. So now if someone clicks the interface uh, it should get here. If however we do... Oh, what happened? What is happening here? Oh, an extra bracket there, sorry. Uh, if we go into the interface itself, obviously now we just print out clicked. That's not what we want, right? No. We want to send the packet. Packet handler dot send button packet and then it's just a matter of um, doing so. There you go. So quite simple. Just tell the client send the IT to the server side then by using some tricks uh, so we don't have to send along the tile entity or anything we can just um, grab the tile entity on the server side and tell the tile entity to do something when we receive a a button click depending on the ID. Right, so what should we do here? Well, we can just do a switch like so. Uh, there you go. And case 0, so in case of the first button, then we want to do something. And um, if we head over to the block, we have this code. This is the exact code that we wanted to, rep well, basically replace because we want to be able to enable and disable this block and to do so we can just steal this code or we'll steal it, it's our code anyways and put it in here like this obviously we, we will have to do a few differences 
we will have to refer to it as world orb. We will have to refer to x chords, uh, y chords, and so on. Yes, because these are called this uh, differently here. Chord y x and world orb. There you go. So we send the information to the client. Oh, well, no, not to the client, from the client to the server, and then the server is going to execute that, change the metadata, and then the client will see that. So let's see how this looks like. Okay. We go. So as you can see, it's enabled. That's the text there on top. Uh, it's going to go grey if it's not disabled. Uh, well, when it is disabled, sorry. So if I hit disable now, it's going to be grey. If I hit disable again, it's going to be enabled and be black. So it always says disable. So that's maybe not the best thing because basically we use it for enabling things when, well, otherwise. So um, you know, it might be a good idea to tell the button to change text. So how do we do that? Um, well, we obviously head over to the GUI machine here because it's the, in the GUI that we will have to change these things. And well, to yeah, do things properly, or well, to make it simple for us, I'm going to specify the two different states here. So we have enable text, that's the uh, text that says enable, and then I have the disable text here uh, that says disable. So I can basically just refer to those two and I don't have to care about what their, their texts actually are. And um, well, then it's just a matter of uh, defining which we should use here. That, that's the first step at least. So um, what we can do is just get the machine, but we can't. We haven't saved it. But it's very easy to do. We have it there anyways. We know which uh, tile entity this interface is connected to. So it's just a matter of saving it like this. So as you can see, when we work with interfaces, it's a lot about connecting containers and tile entities and interfaces together uh, like this. Obviously, that's only the case if we have a tile entity that is showing the interface. Otherwise, we might connect it to a... Um, Cards, for instance, an entity. Uh, machine dot. How do we get the metadata? Well, we can do so. Get met. Um, get block metadata. Sorry, like that. So we can actually ask for that right away. It has some limitations uh, to get the metadata like this. We will we'll see that later on in this lecture. That, um, but it, it's totally fine to use it uh, right here. Okay. So what we want to do is check that. Well, oops. Mod mod 2 equals 0. Uh, that means that it is enabled. So if it is enabled to start with, then we want to give it the disabled text. Otherwise, we want to give it the enabled text, like so. And just to make it simple to see, we might put that on another row like that. Uh, it still is just a one statement, but, but to just keep this on its own line there. So if it's uh, enabled, then give it a disabled text, and if it's not, then give it the enabled text. But this is, of course, only when we create the GUI. So if we actually click the button, it's not going to change. Well, this is a bit of a problem, because we can't really do too much about it. We can tell it to update uh, when we click the button, but if we tell it to just use this code again, uh, when we click the button, it's not going to work. And the reason is, well, when we click the button, we're going to send the information to the server. The server is going to process that and change the metadata and then send the metadata to the client. But that's going to take a few ticks. So even at the, ver at the very best, we will be too late if we try to update it right away. So what we can do is just simulate the click on, on the client side, which is not the best, thi best of things, but it is a thing and it work works pretty well. Uh, oops. There you go. So if we have the bu button zero, which is this one, um, up there, then we want to change the uh, the text. So we can just do that. Display string. There we go. And if that one equals uh, disable text, 
Um, come on, there you go. Sorry. If that equals disable text, then what we want is enable text. Otherwise, we want to disable text. So I just swap these uh, back and forth. And well, this is not the best thing, best way to do it, because now if I have two players, I mean my friend is watching, it, uh, taking a look in the in uh, interface, and I'm clicking the button. My friend won't see that the text updates. It will still work properly, so if the player clicks it, it's going to do what it's supposed to do. So if I click it to disable, then the friend can enable it, even though it says disable. So it's not the best of things um, to do. Uh, we'll have some, some small problems there. But it's, it's the best we can do at the moment. We'll take a closer look how we can make sure that this information is properly synced at all times in the next lecture. But it's pretty good still. So it just swaps when we click it on the client side and then it gets a proper value to start with. So even if the friend is watching the interface and I click it so something actually changes, then well, if that person is closing the interface and opening it again, then it's going to update properly because we have this code to start with. So the initial value will, co will be correct, but if multiple players are uh, changing it at the same time, it won't be updated properly. So that's a bit of a drawback here, but uh, like I said, we will take a better look at what we can do instead in the next lecture. But for now, it's totally fine to do it like that. Let's take a look. Here we go. And uh, finish loading. Right. So I'm just going to open up, and when we click this, the button this time, we can see uh, that it's, it's changing. So now I have it's it's already disabled from the start because well we obviously left it like that last time. So now if I click it, it's going to say enable. Yes, because it checks the metadata, and if you realize, oh right, it's already disabled, maybe the button should say enable instead. And then when I click enable, it's just going to change over to disable. Um, it's only going to do that for me, but that's good enough when I play on my own. But if multiple players are activating the interface at the same time, we will have some, some issues there, but just uh, graphical issues. So, there you are. Sweet. I think it works pretty well. Sweet. So, what's the next step? Well, let's take a look on the interface uh, that I have prepared. Uh, if you want to use them yourself, you can just find them in the source code on the lecture page, or if you're watching this live, I posted them there earlier in the chat. So what we want to head, oops, not that one, assets. So the textures I have here is a bit different from the last time. Um, I'm going to use machine two later on, but for now I'm going to use machine one. Um, there we go. As you can see, we have the normal interface that uh, that I had last time. We can zoom this a bit. Uh, there you go. Uh, like that. But I have also added some things down here below the actual interface. And this is sort of how you do things when you want to do them dynamically, dynamically change things. You have the, the part that you always want to draw, and the reason why these things don't show up is, of course, because I define what I want to draw. I define what rectangle I want to draw. Uh, we can take a look on that there, here. Uh, where is it here? Look, I'm just drawing from 0, zero to G, uh, X size and Y size, and those are specified like this. So I don't tell it to draw everything. That would be ridiculous. I just want to draw to draw the main interface. So uh, these things will still be in the texture file, but they won't uh, well be shown with, with the normal rectangle. And like I said, this is how we draw interfaces, because now we can refer to those three and draw them on the interface. Uh, but we don't have to draw them all. We don't have to draw them all the time. And as you can see, one is an arrow for the arrow card, one is the border for the border card, and one is the cross for the cross card. So basically what I'm going to do is draw the appropriate icon depending on the type. So let's close this for now. There you go. Um, and we're going to do that in the background, of course. And we don't have to bind the texture or anything, because we've done that already. So since we uh, set the current texture there, it's going to be the current texture until we bind something else. So we don't have to do that again. So what I want to do is get the um, the type to start with. Um, so which type do we have? And it's fairly simple. That's just um, the machine dot get uh, block method dot like so divided by two. So that's which type I have. The type zero is the blank one. Type one is the uh, 
um, the arrow type 2 is bolded, type 3 is the cross. So uh, what we want to do is obviously we want to draw it if we have a type that is not blank. There's no reason to draw a blank type because, well, we didn't have an icon for it. Like that. And how do we do this? How do we d draw something dynamic like this? And there's nothing special really. When it comes to interfaces, you have some um, core mechanics and then you just use them in smart ways. So when we want to draw the correct thing here, the thing we want to do is just specify where do we get it from. And that's going to be 20 times the type minus 1. And why is that the case? Well, if if we have type 0, that's the blank one, we're not going to do this at all. If we have type 1, that's the arrow one, we, we saw that the arrow was to the very left in the interface, uh, in the texture sheet, sorry. And, well, if we do, um, uh, sorry here, um, if we do 1 minus 1 times 20, that's 0, so therefore we start at the very left when we want to draw things. We saw that the border was the next one, and border's type is 2, so then we have type, mi that's 2, minus 1, that's 1, times 20, that's 20. How big is one of these uh, texture textures? Well, they are 20 by tw 20, and that's exactly why I have 20 here. And if we have the cross, then we have 3 minus 1, so that's 2, times 20, that's 40, so that means we get the next texture. So if we want to draw it dynamically, so we just change icons, or well, change parts of the texture, depending on, uh, well, a, a variable of some sort, in this case the type, then we can very easily do so. We just define where we want to find the texture. The source of y is quite simple as well. We just want to get that from the y size. And that's just the... Um, just because I place it just below the size of the the um, the interface itself. If I place it somewhere else, I would obviously have to define the source y uh, in some other sense. But when we have it like this, we can draw a textured model rect like so. And we already have defined a few things. I have told you that it was 20 by 20, no matter what. Then I've told you that, uh, well, we have already calculated source x and source y. And finally, we want to set these two things. And that's of that, of course, depends where we want to place them. But the mo most important part are GUI left and GUI top. And then it's just a matter of where we want them to be. And I've already checked that. And I think it looks pretty good to put them at 16 there. So that's the x coordinate. And here we have 42. Like that. So now if we take a look, we can run it. Uh, we'll see um, some things, I hope. Um, here we go. So what we will see is uh, when we change the type, we'll see that that is going to show up in the interface. It's not going to say anything or, or something but it's fine. At the moment, nothing is showing up here, and hopefully that is because we haven't set a type with these type cards. I'm just going to grab some of those. And if I select the arrow type there, now we have an arrow. If I select the border, now we will have a border. And finally, if I use the cross, we will have a cross. So as you can see, it's very simple actually to draw different things depending on, on a variable of some sort of value. And this case the metadata we're using that to define a type and depending on the type we want to draw one of three textures inside the interface there and the only thing we do is just well we ca calculate where we should start drawing where is our source location and since I have three icons in the texture sheet I can just refer to them and the icons themselves they were placed sort of like here uh, when it came to the uh, interface uh, yeah, sorry the interfaces texture sheet and therefore they won't be drawn uh, normally, yes, because, well, we have defined it to only draw this rectangle here when it comes to the normal part. And then, depending on the type, we're drawing some things on top, like that. But, well, just, just the plus like that, uh, or the border, or the arrow, isn't really too nice. Maybe we should have some text nearby here. So, like I said, we were supposed to take a further look into the text, so that's what I'm going to do now. Because, well, we can obviously add multiple ones. And now I'm going to add a few different versions of this, but to start with, we're going to do it like this. We want a type, uh, data like this, um, sorry, and divided by two, of course, so that's our type. And um, what we want to do is grab a string and then 
uh, print it all out in the end. And to do so, we, well, you should know this, it's font renderer dot draw string. Uh, and then we give it the uh, text, that's str for string, and then obviously the location. And uh, of course you need to sort of check w what looks good here, and it's just a matter of taking uh, using the values you think is correct, and then just launch the Minecraft instance to see if it actually looks good, and make, make some tweaks there. But I've already done that, so, well to spare some time. So I've set it to 45, 48, and that looks pretty good. So that's going to be to the left of the icon that we have. Now it's going to complain because we never set a value to, to the string. So, well, that's understandable, I guess. Okay. So if the type equals zero, that means that we don't have anything, um, any selected thing, that is, no type selected. So then I want to draw that, uh, draw the string, no type selected. Otherwise, what I might want to do is draw uh, how many anvils do we need for a drop. Remember, if we give the redstone signal, then we're going to drop some anvils in the appropriate shape. And we can just, and if, well, tell it uh, like this. So int count. Um, and what we can see, I can, I can do switch here, even though a switch is not the best thing to do. But that's at least going to show us what's going on here. So if I do a switch of the type, what I will see now is that for the case one, that's the arrow, uh, we want to set the count to five, like that. For the case two, and actually case three as well, we know that, so that's the border and the cross, both of them are using 12 anvils, like that. So as you can see, it's not the best thing to do to use a, a switch. So what we could do is just remove it here and do if type equals 1, then count equals 5, else uh, count equals 12. But of course if we had more, um, bigger, yeah, blah, bigger span of these values, sorry, uh, then the switch might be better. But at the moment we just have two different values. If, if it's um, at the arrow we have 5, otherwise we have 12. And then we can just use this count here. Requires count anvils per drop. Like that. And it's just a matter of starting it to see. So now we can draw different things, uh, different strings, depending on the type as well. Uh, not a problem there, it works the same way. Here we go. So now we should sit sort of in an appropriate location, the text. But oops. As you can see, it doesn't fit. But apart from that, it's working. It tells us, oops, it tells us how many. We need 12 anvils there. We need uh, 5 anvils there. And if I place a new machine to get a blank one, it tells us no type selected. So the only problem we had was uh, that it's too long. And of course, that is um, something I knew about. So I have prepared a solution. So what do we want to use instead? How do we get room with all of that? Well, what we can do is draw a split string, like I accidentally typed in the beginning. And what that is going to do is it's going to want us to add a another parameter here. And what that does is tell, tells it, well, we want it to be in the width of 100 pixels. If it's going to be longer than 100 pixels, or rather if it's going to be longer than 100 pixels when it adds the next word that we want to type. Obviously, we have, we have multiple words in our string. So if the next word is going to be uh, making the string too long, wider than 100 pixel, then it's going just going to add a new line and start in the next line. So that's why we have to tell it how wide it should be. But now when we do this, to make it look better, I'm actually going to move it up a bit. So we get the center of the icon, the center of the li little text there, uh, in between the two lines. So now if we run it, it should look much better. Here we go. And um, 
There you go. Uh, and boom. There you go. Much better. So now it realizes that, oh right, when I'm trying to uh, type per here, then it's uh, going to be too wide. Obviously it's not going to be too wide for the interface, but too wide for the 100 pixels. So if we wanted more to fit on one line, we could just set the 100 pixels to be, well, like 120 or something like that, then it might be over here rather than here, as the border is. So, um, there you go. Now it looks better. But like I said, of course we could, if we wanted to, make it go a bit further here, but I'm going to use this space for something else later on. So, uh, what do we want to do next? Well, what I'm going to do is draw it in a different color. We can use multiple colors, no problem. And how that is going to work is the following. I want to have a boolean value defining if this is invalid or not. Boolean uh, invalid. And by default I'm going to actually set it to true. And um, here we go. So if it's invalid, what I want it to, the color to be set to is uh, I prepared a red, uh, neat red one. So um, D D3000000. Zero, 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 zero. So yeah, this is a red color. It's uh, not the brightest of the red colors, but it's pretty bright. Um, and what we have here is uh, the red part, and then we have uh, no green and no blue like that. And otherwise, if it's not invalid, then we want to use the default color. But like I said, more uh, we will touch hexadecimal colors a bit in the bits and pieces uh, course, but otherwise just make a quick Google search about how you can type uh, hexadecimal colors. It works the same for like HTML and things like that. Um, so then I'm just going to use color in here, like that. So now it's always invalid, well the colors are always going to define it as invalid. But how do I set it to be sort of valid? And what I'm going to do here is simply uh, set it here. So if machine.getAnvil. So I want to get the amount of anvils from the machine. Anvils. If that is greater than or equal to the count, that means that we actually do have enough anvils for this drop and therefore we can set invalid to false to use the normal color. Seems like it makes sense in my opinion, but of course we need to define how it gets these anvils. Like this. Right, so how do we calculate this? Well, it's fairly simple. Int count, so we set that to zero, and in the end we want to return it. But of course we need to increase it by the amount of animals we do have. It's fairly simple. Yeah, we've seen similar things before. We just loop through all the items in the inventory, uh, all the in indices at least, and then we get the stack at that specific location, like so. When we have that, what we want to make sure is that the item stack is not null. And just to make sure, we can check that the uh, item uh, is valid for this specific slot. It should be, but we don't know for sure. The, someone might have been able to put something else there that is not an anvil. So if that's the case, then we can just increase the count with the stack size like so. So that's a very simple method for just calculating how many animals we have. We loop through all the items that we do have, like so, and if we found an item that we double check to be valid, then that's obviously an animal increased by the amount of animals we have in that stack. So if we have a stack of 64, we obviously had 64 there. Okay, so now if everything works properly, we will see that if we don't have a type selected, it's going to be sort of red. The color will be red for being invalid. And if we don't have enough anvils, it's going to be red as well. If I add these anvils here, we'll see that it's going to change the color right away. Just because, um, well, all of a sudden we have enough anvils. If we have a blank one of these, we will see that it won't... Uh, have a type selected obviously and therefore it's going to be red as well. If we take a look here and I'm just going to remove uh, most of these, so I have a 8 there, obviously it's going to be red there but if I change the type to the arrow it's going to be uh, the normal grey color just because now we only require 5 anvils uh, per drop. 
So that's pretty much it for now. I'm going to uh, make a another version of this get annuals after the break and then we will use that for some other things as well. We will also take a look on how we can do proper shift clicking after the break and as well as a few other things when it comes to drawing some textures and actually also drawing some icons. But like I said, that's after the break. I'll see you in about 15 minutes.